scientific illustration and communication careers. So thank you for joining. And the reason why I'm giving this presentation is because I am the founder of Simplified Science Publishing, and my name is Karen Tebus, and my goal is to help researchers and business professionals improve how they share their data story through illustrations and animations. And I've been doing this career for a long time. I moved from being a PhD in neuroscience to the science communications career. So I'm really looking forward to sharing some of my tips and tricks on the journey that I've had that may help you with yours. And today for this webinar, we're going to review what is a scientific communication career. There's lots of different areas and opportunities to have a SciComm career. So I'm going to go through some of those that you may not have even thought of before. I'm then going to get into where to start and tips on how to make that journey yourself with a specific focus on scientific illustration careers and scientific writing careers, as well as the ability to build your own unique career. It doesn't have to be in one bubble. I'll then go over the tips for success and have a long question answer session to get any questions you may have about scientific communication careers. And like I said, starting with what is a scientific communication career? There are lots of different avenues, right? You can go to industry and academia. You can focus on visual skills like illustration or writing skills. But the main thing I want to point out with scientific communication careers is that you can pick one bubble, right? So I've picked for myself illustration as my main bubble, but almost everything with a scientific communication career will begin to overlap with other things. No matter whether you're doing illustration or writing, you're likely going to have to communicate well through writing and even visuals, regardless of what your strength is. Animation is another popular scientific communication career. And so is data visualization and podcasts. I would say that these main five bubbles are what most people think of as traditional scientific communication careers, right? Whether they're doing it visually through podcasts or writing, sharing scientific information to the public or to researchers and in a way that makes it engaging and interesting and highlights the value of all of that interesting scientific information. But what I want to also get across to you today is that it's it can always be a combination of these bubbles. You don't have to pick one bubble. It doesn't have to be just academia, just industry. And there are other parts of a scientific communication career that especially if you're starting in a scientific research lab, you may not be thinking of, which are things like project management, marketing, and even admin. These are three additional bubbles that I put on the right that I feel like many people, especially if you're currently working in a lab, think of as less common, but they're just as important skills and parts of a scientific communication career that can really fulfill and fill out a really exciting career that involves scientific information and the ability to communicate that. Because as you know, it's not just writing something fantastic. It's not just creating something visually engaging. It's how you work with people. It's how you share that information with people. Admin and project management is how you work with people to share that information. Marketing, I even thought to myself in academia, oh, marketing, I don't know, that sounds like a dirty word. But marketing, especially when it comes to scientific information, I see that as just sharing that important information, right? We're not talking about marketing Doritos chips. We're talking about marketing and sharing your scientific information. So as I go through some of my tips and tricks and scientific communication career tips, know that I'll probably be bringing these three in less thought of sort of elements of a scientific communication career, just as a reminder that there's a lot of different ways you can build a career that uses any of these bubbles shown here. And I wanna start with this big question of where to start. Some of you are already further along in your science communication groups. Some of you are just wondering, do I even wanna do this? Do I wanna stay in a research lab? Do I wanna stay with the company I'm at? And 
it's one of those things where it's a little cheesy, but I really recommend that if you're just starting or if you're contemplating a change from your current career, that the first step you take is to just brainstorm the list, write out journal entry about the types of tasks and activities that bring you both satisfaction and pride. And this doesn't have to be directly related to scientific communication. It can be, you know, obviously if you enjoy illustrating or making visuals, that's obviously an illustration focused career, but it can also be things like, I really love organizing all of our labs antibodies and I'm the project manager for keeping track of all of our scientific materials we're using. It could be, I enjoy working with people. I prefer working alone. You can start to brainstorm things and aspects that you enjoy about a potential career. And what this brainstorm will do for you is it'll help you reflect and think critically about what kind of things you wanna start looking for as you build your own career or change of career. And after you've brainstormed that list, the next step is to experiment and get experience. I like to think of this stage as a sort of a, a carefree experiment and experience because you don't have to know exactly what you're going to do right out the gate. I didn't, uh, as, my, as I was doing my PhD in neuroscience, I knew I loved science. I knew I loved creating presentations and explaining the science and I enjoyed illustrating. But until I had more time testing the digital art tools and going to networking events to ask people, what do you do, right? I, I, I sort of popped the academic bubble and went to industry events, things like biotech networking events, not with the goal of actually pitching anything because I had nothing to pitch. I was just asking the question, what do you do? And I was learning more and gaining experience to just see, hey, this person does this really interesting thing in the science sphere that I had no idea it existed. So I really recommend going through and experimenting, talking to people, testing out free tools first, just to see where your experiment and experience starts to lie. And just as an example, uh, when I was first starting out, I learned from an online class, how to use Photoshop, and the results of that Photoshop in my first sort of my own experiment, experiment experience was this drawing here that I just show with this parachute science girl. And you know, it wasn't horrible, but it's certainly not necessarily at a professional level. And that's okay. When you're doing the experiment and experience stage, it's okay for you not to be great yet. You can just be good and sort of good and or see the potential you don't have to be there right away. And eventually I went from, you know, about a year and a half later realizing I do love this digital drawing and I want to learn more. I want to get better. And about a year and a half of training, I could draw consistently beautiful and simple artworks like this I showed on the right. And then from there, I would build skills even further. So again, just a reminder, you don't have to be good in the experiment experiment stage. Don't be afraid to try new things that are aligned with what you think you might enjoy. And the next step in the science career pathway, I do recommend you take a minute to do a refinement of your skills and interests and do another period of reflection where as you're starting to build new skills, make sure that it still aligns with your strengths and that it brings you at least some enjoyment, right? Work is still work. It may not always be joyful. It might sometimes be hard and frustrating, but as long as most of the things you're trying to get better at make you happy, then keep going in that direction and start to trim off some of the things that are making you less happy. For me, I knew I wanted to do a sci-con career while getting my PhD. I was like, I, I might do writing. I'm going to practice writing. I'm starting to learn how to illustrate things. I don't know how well that's going to go. And I, I was pretty good at writing. I was okay at illustrating, but I loved illustrating so much that I continued to refine my skills and get better and better at making digital art. And that reflection period was really helpful for me to keep pushing me in the illustration direction over focusing completely on a writing communication career direction. And then finally, after you've sort of refined some of your skills and interests, that's when I think it's a time to invest in professional training, right? You may want to take courses, professional courses, to improve whatever it is 
that's making you most excited about your SciComm skills. You may want to join a company in an entry-level position. Maybe you join as a project administrator, or in my case, I actually joined a marketing company doing search engine optimization analysis. So doing some data analysis, doing uh, website design analysis, and I was an entry-level position that I learned a lot from that I could then bring back to my SciComm career path later on. So don't be afraid to test and build skills in a variety of ways that might get to your destination. And then, of course, at this stage, if you're starting to really refine your skills, you should be building a website to showcase your work, right? It can take time, but it's very important that you build a website that's mobile friendly and is really easy for your potential customers to see what you do, see your style, and decide to hire you if that's something that they, they align with. And finally, after you've got all those steps taken care of in your science communication career path, it's time to land that job or launch your business. This usually starts with making sure you update that resume and your website with all the potential things that showcase what you can do and apply, apply, apply. I'm going to have another section where we can talk a little bit more about launch your business logistics, but I will just give a couple tips now, one of which is you may want to pay a lawyer a one-time fee for your own statement of work. We'll talk about this a little bit towards the end in the tips for success, but a statement of work can be very helpful in making sure that if you're signing clients, that they know what to expect, they're signing an agreement that aligns with that work that you're going to do for them. And it's important that that be legally binding. And then if you're new to starting a business, back up, you can also go to thebalancemoney.com where this I think is one of the best websites. And I'll add that link at the very end in the chat that this website page very clearly gives you the step-by-step -step of if you're ready to launch a business, follow these steps to create your own independent contractor company. Okay. And here I'm gonna pause just for a little bit and see everyone in the chat. And no one's got a question yet, which is all right. We've got a lot coming up. Anyone have any questions so far on the journey? Okay, right, then let's jump in to some of the specifics. So, in my case, I focused on starting a scientific illustration career. And I think the two most important things you need to know about starting a scientific illustration career are one, who hires scientific illustrators? And the good news is that every research institute or university, almost every single pharmaceutical and medical device company, museums, zoos, publishing companies, web and animation firms, there are a lot of companies out there that are looking for excellent visuals, right? So they are looking for their websites, for their publications, and there's a variety of different types of illustrations that you can do to meet the needs of these potential hiring entities. And the second thing I wanna point out is in order to get hired, the, the main things you're going to need to learn if you want to become a scientific illustrator are then the tools that allow you to create those digital illustrations. Now, I'm not going to get into pen and paper illustrations. I know there's a lot of fantastic medical illustrators who do things with things like watercolor and oil paints. And that's another skill set that is also potential to have a good scientific illustration career. But I will say that from my experience, almost everybody is requiring digital illustrations. And I have a question here, will it be possible to access the video? Yes, the video will be accessible at the end. I'll make sure everybody has an email and has access to the video. Oh, and it's more questions, we'll pause, okay. This question comes in, do we need a complete degree or certificate in illustration or self-training sufficient to get into these professions? And I would say for any scientific communication career, you don't need to have a scientific illustration degree or too much formal training if you have a scientific background. So most scientific illustrator 
need to have either a master's or PhD in science. That's usually a requirement. And then if you have either a PhD or a master's degree in a scientific field, then you can just prove that you can illustrate with your portfolio. I didn't take a formal degree in scientific illustration. I relied on my scientific knowledge and then built my skills in illustration using a couple schools. I went, I did take a class at Portland Art Institute, but it was just one class. Everything else I built through online training and then just building my portfolio. So my answer is if you have a scientific degree that's high enough, you don't necessarily have to have that formal full certificate or degree. And that's my path. I would say if you wanted to become a medical illustrator, specifically who work with you know, medical textbooks and work for a specific company that does just medical illustration, it does make it easier to get those jobs if you have that formal medical scientific illustration training. But again, it's not a requirement. You can, if you have the skills, get the job because you can prove you can illustrate through your portfolio. So that's a really good question. And as far as getting those skills and what skills to build for digital illustration, I'm showing here what I consider sort of the main things to consider learning. Adobe Illustrator, far on this left, is one of the most important scientific illustration tools used by a lot of professionals. And that's the main tool I use. Next up is this Adobe Creative Cloud, because although I use Adobe Illustrator as my sort of 2D and some 3D illustration workhorse, knowing how to use Adobe Illustrator in combination with other Adobe products such as InDesign, uh, such as Photoshop, and even their animation, there's Adobe After Effects, all of the things under the Adobe Cloud can be extremely useful when you're trying to build your skills and expand your skills beyond just 2D illustration. So those are my top two recommendations for software to begin learning. However, I will say Adobe Creative Cloud is not cheap. Um, Adobe Illustrator is not cheap. So if you are new to illustration and you're not willing to invest in that level and full suite of software, I wanted to point out that there is software coming from a company that's really fantastic. And it's the one I'm recommending is called Affinity Designer. It has almost all of the capabilities of Adobe Illustrator. It lacks some of the um, gradient and really advanced tools that can make some very stellar sort of techniques. But if you're doing good illustration, basic illustration, Affinity Designer has almost all of the things you will ever need that Adobe Illustrator has. And it's a one-time payment for the software. So if you're looking to start building these skills, Affinity Designer is a more cost-effective way to do it. And the skills you'll learn in Affinity Designer parallel really well with Adobe Illustrator files. And you can even open Adobe Illustrator files in Affinity Designer. So that's a great place to start if you are looking into building your scientific illustration skills but aren't ready to invest in Adobe Illustrator. And then on the right, what I'm going to show you just to talk a little bit about is there's two of my top two 3D illustration and Autodesk 3D illustration in Maya is what I would consider an extremely professional, again, expensive, but what I used to learn some 3D illustration and it's a fantastic software. It's not easy to learn. Blender is a, a free software and that also is an extremely valuable tool if you're learning 3D. So you don't have to choose one or the other. I do recommend perhaps starting with 2D illustration tools if you're not used to this. But again, if you want to expand to really doing full 3D illustrations, then Blender and Autodesk Maya are good options. Now it looks like we have some things in the chat. So we have a question here. What would you say is the average amount of time to get up and running with Adobe software? Yeah, overall thought on the timeline. I would say, well, for me personally, it took, I would say a year of taking a class and really then practicing what I learned in that class before I felt like, okay, I can draw most things pretty well. So I'd actually say about a year, but 
a year where you're not just sometimes clicking around, but a year where you might have a goal of you know, every week, I'm going to draw something new, right? It doesn't have to be good to start, but if you're working weekly for a year to improve, how do I click? How do I use the vector point tools? How do I make this shape? How do I merge shapes? How do I make you know gradients look good? Uh, weekly for a year, and you should actually be pretty decent at getting good at Illustrator. Yeah, that's, I'm glad that was helpful. And somebody mentioned, I really love Affinity. It works great. And yes, the one-time payment is real. Yeah, Affinity Designer is a great software. Um, like I said, it's it does almost everything Illustrator does, so I do highly recommend it. I have another question here. Did you build your portfolio by illustrating random research project that inspired you or by offering illustration for free? Actually, so when I first started uh, illustrating, I had, um, well, one, I was still in my PhD. So I started to try to illustrate my own research. So I was illustrating things that were going to go into my dissertation. I was illustrating things that did end up in my publication in Nature Communications. And that was a great place to start because it was very practical. I wasn't wasting my time. I was using it to illustrate what I was working on in a lab. While I was doing that, I was also doing some additional practice with more, I guess what you would say, just uh, more creative work by illustrating human organs. I was doing it because I was coming up with ideas on how I might make chapters of a book where I explain how the human organs work. And yeah, that was something that I did for fun. So I recommend doing something practical that's illustrating toward whatever you're currently working on. So you don't feel like, you know, you're not using your time efficiently. But if you have a creative project, if you have a creative idea and that's fueling you, use it. Because actually, as I get into this, I'm going to show you that those illustrations I did for human organs, I actually, they weren't the best in the world. But I will point out, let's see, that I use them on my blog. Um, and remarkably, one of them, the diaphragm anatomy. So I did this, these sort of, they're not that simple, but I did these illustrations when I was first learning. I drew a little hiccup goblin when I was first learning. And I didn't know I was going to add this to my portfolio or to my website. I was trying to create really interesting, you know, how does the diaphragm work illustrations. And now this page ranks and people actually look on this in the first page for how does the diaphragm work. So you don't know, you never know where your initial tinkerings may end up. You know, it's not the best drawn goblin in the world, but when it's aligned with good content, good written content and built on a web page that users find useful, this now gets a lot of traffic to my website just because it has good information and it's easy for people to understand the concept, even though it's not the most impressive illustration techniques in the world. So that's a great question. And I think I have another question here. Uh, would you recommend software such as BioRender that has pre-made icons or images, or does that take away the skills you can offer companies? I don't recommend using BioRender if you're trying to become a scientific illustrator. Uh, it's, it's a great, resource. It has amazing amounts of templates, but the problem with those templates in BioRender is that you cannot customize them. And that customization is really what people are looking for if they're going to hire a scientific illustrator, right? You can only get so far with BioRender tools to really communicate clearly the main point of somebody's research. And that's where, when you can actually customize every single point of an illustration, every single aspect of an illustration, that's what people are really looking for when they're looking for custom content. So I don't recommend BioRender um, as a tool that you get too familiar with. Again, I'm not hating on it entirely. It has its uses. It especially helps people who have no illustration skills. Um, but if you're trying to build your scientific illustration skills, I would say download Affinity Designer first and start to even download vector templates. I do sell some vector templates on my website. Lots of people sell vector templates and you can start with those fully customizable templates to then learn 
how to make those similar types of things yourself, and then even customize those templated images as you learn more. And let's see, another question from Audrey. What is your opinion on using freelance gig websites, such as Fiverr, to build a portfolio when first starting out? And yeah, we're getting into some good questions. And is there a baseline rate that would be appropriate to charge as an amateur without undervaluing my work? And I don't, I, I do think that Fiverr uh, and TopTal, T-O-P-T-A-L, both are good freelance gig websites. And they're not bad if you're starting out and you don't have, you know, any client prospects and you're trying to build your client prospects. That's an interesting way to do it. I would say there is how much you charge is very personal and it's up to your own cost of living, where you're living. But I would say I started out for myself comfortably at $35 an hour and $35 an hour for somebody who can create good enough illustrations, I think is a reasonable rate for just starting out. As long as you produce things that people like in the end, that actually gives you high enough ratings to stay on Fiverr. Um, I've never been on Fiverr myself. They do take a percentage of your cut. Uh, but again, I've heard actually good things from other freelancers where if you can get really good reviews on Fiverr and your rate is aligning with the reviews you're getting, people feel good about what they're paying for, then Fiverr can really actually do a great job in building your business. I would suggest that if you're just starting out and you aren't sure what to charge and you're not sure how to get your first clients, that you actually, instead of just jumping directly into something like Fiverr, I started going to networking events as my first just talking to people about my skills. I had a portfolio online and that was my first set of clients was I was networking with past researchers at conferences that I've been to. I was networking with people in my area who got to know me, trusted me, saw my website, said, yeah, I'll give her a try. So I do think don't undervalue networking as your way to build your first set of clients that you can do work for and even learn from. That's how I did it. and. That worked well for me, but again, how it works for you and whether you choose to join Fiverr, which is another option, everyone has their own path. There's no one right answer. Uh, Behance, I've never done Behance and I haven't heard about anyone doing Behance. So I can't offer any insight on Behance. Uh, will you post some useful resources like this website in the chat at the end? Yes, Ankar, I will make sure I just sort of in our end of our Q&A session, I'll reiterate some of the great things we've talked about for resources. Yep, great. And I think that's all the questions we have on this section so far, which is good. Love that you guys are piping up with questions on scientific illustration careers. And before I move on from scientific illustration careers, I want to get into <laughs> sort of branching into what you guys have already been talking about, which is even more ways that you can find scientific illustration jobs. And I already started to talk about this, but networking, I don't, I think especially post COVID, which was obviously complicated for everyone. Now that it's getting a little more safe to be with people again, I recommend looking up local events. I can't tell you how important that was for me to first, without having any skills, learn more about people in the industry, just make friends with people who are doing different cool things in the scientific community, then building my skills and coming back to them saying, hey, I have these skills and I know you're working on X project. Would it be something that you would might you would want to collaborate on? So networking can really build your first doors. Um, and in fact, one of my clients, I would say actually, who's one of my largest, longest running clients came through one of my first you know, sets of networking in Oregon. I went to the Oregon Bioscience Innovator Conference Network. And that person is still a client who takes me with them wherever they go for their job in the last seven years to do their presentation designs and their illustrations. So you never know who you're going to meet in networking events. And I also recommend getting into scientific illustrations associations and societies. These do require charges, so I wouldn't jump into these as a first choice. 
scientific illustration associations often can have a hundred and something dollar fees. So I would say, unless you have a very specific goal, for example, there's a medical scientific illustrator association that's a great networking place, but it's also pretty expensive. But if your end goal, you already know, I, I've done my reflection, I want to be a medical illustrator and animator. Those could be some great resources for you to meet more people specifically doing what you want to do in that niche. So that's a good way to go. The next thing I recommend is don't be afraid to just online job search. You may not even be close or even close to ready to find a job. But what I wanted to point out here is that by reading more about scientific illustration jobs, and right now this was just, I just got the screenshot this week. So there are 44 more jobs with scientific illustration in the title. You can, you know, see what they want, right? You can also try to build your skills by looking at what people are looking for and realizing, hey, this sounds like something I want to do. I don't have the skills to apply yet. But you can start to build those skills by actually looking ahead and seeing what people are looking for. So I think that's also a very valuable thing to do if you're looking for a scientific illustration career. And finally, marketing outreach. That includes building that impressive portfolio, especially with illustration. You've got to kind of prove what you can do. And at first, you might be just drawing your own things for yourself or drawing your own things that don't have a publication home yet or an end goal besides learning more and then showcasing your skills. And that's okay. Um, you know, eventually you will get clients, build it and they will come, right? So if you're good enough and if you enjoy it enough, don't give up. It can take time, but build that portfolio and keep trying to make it as impressive as you can with each iteration. And again, even if you, let's say you want to search for a specific company, some people have, you know, they don't want to move. They want to work in a certain place. They may have family or other reasons to be in one place. And that can also be an interesting way. It's like determine that this looks like a place you want to end up working or work with certain people and target them, right? See what they're looking for. Outreach to them, pitch them specifically what you could do for them, not in a sort of intense way, but slowly build a network toward that company if that's something you're interested in. And then finally, social media is a valuable way to showcase that you're active in the scientific illustration community. Um, I would say job seekers nowadays may look up your social media just to see, does this person, has this person been around a while? Have they been posting? Are they passionate about what they're doing? And it's not a necessity. I would just say I put this one last for a reason. I actually do this somewhat poorly. I should probably do more social media, but it is still an important part of the equation of finding jobs and finding people interested in you and you finding things you might be interested in. Right? You can also look up scientific illustration on Twitter, see who else is commenting about scientific illustration, and you may make a connection that way. Okay, so that was a lot about scientific illustration, jobs and careers. And now I want to pivot into scientific writing careers. This is not a path that I took in full. I, I did it more as writing website content uh, for myself and for other client websites. And I also do some grant writing work. It's a much smaller piece of my freelance puzzle, but I still wanted to share my insights about what I've learned about scientific writing careers and know that you know, communication through writing is going to be essential, no matter whether you're going to be an illustrator or using scientific writing as your primary freelance goal. So again, who hires scientific writers? The good news is lots of companies, right? Publishing companies, magazines, new papers, those are often considered the most common ones you think of. But you should also be aware that research institutes and universities, scientific industry companies, these two have what are called communications departments or admin departments that are contributing and supporting scientific writing at their institutions. So if you're interested in staying in academia, but not doing research on a bench, take a walk around your research institute and go talk to the admin people. Go see, well, what do you do? Would you mind grabbing a coffee? Um, often the admin and project managers and people who are in the communications 
and or admin fields in research institutions, those are still can be considered scientific writing and scientific communication careers that you just haven't really thought of, but they're sitting right next door to you in your lab. So don't be afraid to learn more about what might be in academia, scientific writing jobs, scientific industry. Obviously, there's going to be hiring writers that talk a lot more about their specific products and adding content to the website. Often industry, the main scientific writing you'd be doing is for things like blogs or resource pages or website pages and or materials that they're printing and sending with their products. And that's an interesting niche. And then there's also museums and zoos. I would say museums and zoos, it's a very limited uh, number of jobs. I think the bigger number of jobs are in the top three I mentioned, but that's still an interesting one where if you're passionate, again, if you're passionate, about targeting any one of these sort of scientific writing bubbles, don't be afraid to just start walking toward that interest, right? Listen to yourself. And there is, there are jobs in scientific communication, writing and illustration in any of these companies. You just kind of have to start to walk toward it, learn more about what they're looking for and build those skills towards what they're looking for. And as far as scientific writing, tools or skills. This is obviously less in the software zone, right? You have lots of different options to use writing software. But I will say that especially for writers in the US, the, the National Association of Science Writers is a extremely valuable and active network. Um, this is one where I, I would highly recommend if this is your end goal, you want to be a scientific writer, you want to learn how to write great pitches to publishing companies and you want to connect with other science writers, that's a great network. There's also the World Federation of Science Journalists. That's more in the line of, you know, a specific niche of science journalism, but that's also a great resource to connect. Again, it just depends on what area you feel like aligns with what you want to do. And joining these associations can help you learn a lot from people who have a lot more experience in the field than I do in scientific writing careers. And similarly, how do you find these jobs? It's actually very similar. I would say networking and local events. Those two I mentioned, as far as associations, are really powerful for networking. When it comes to looking up online jobs, again, I just did this search last week hundred plus more jobs for things like scientific writers. There are a lot of companies that you'll see that are looking for either academic minded writers or marketing writers. And there is an important distinction I wanted to make here where an academic writer, that means that you're going to be focused on writing grants, helping edit publications and you know, really making sure that you can have all of that technical story honed in, but written toward a very highly technical audience. Marketing scientific writer is sort of the public audience sphere. And marketing scientific writers are essentially making website content. So all those website pages that you read when you're looking up interesting information about science or learning more about your own SciComm career goals, those are written by writers that get paid for those pages. Sometimes they're internal with a company. Sometimes they're outsourced and freelance for different companies. But more and more scientific writing jobs are available if you're writing things like website pages that explain certain things about different products or interesting information about a company. So keep that in mind. That's a lot of different scientific writing opportunities out there that, again, look at them, read them, see if they align with you. And we have another question and that's okay. It's on uh, illustration. I'll answer it. So uh, back to scientific illustration. Are you using a combination of 2D and 3D softwares or is it okay to specialize in one of these? I personally started using 2D. I then learned how to do 3D and then I pretty much just ran back to 2D. So I think it's up to you. The answer is it's up to you. It's what you feel like you're confident in, you're good at, what software you want to pay for. But you can, I, I primarily just do 2D and you can have a full career just as a 2D illustrator. You can have a full career just as a 3D illustrator. 
Some people have both skills and sometimes they align well with each other. Um, I, but it's possible to have one, the either, or both. So it's um, not necessary to have both. I would say 2D illustration, it's still important that you know how to illustrate 3D elements in 2D software, but that's a skill you can build in 2D. Yeah, so that's a good question. And back to the writing though. So just so we can jump in here, I'm gonna get back on the writing train by then mentioning one of the most important things about writing jobs, which is if you are in an industry where you're trying to get to science news outlets and get paid in science journalism, or even if you're pitching ideas for a company that does marketing or academic writing, honing how to do a good written pitch about what you're going to write and why what you're going to write about is important is extremely important. So if you are interested in scientific writing, honing your abilities to pitch unique ideas is going to be crazy essential to be successful. And I would recommend honing that skill. There's lots of resources out there to improve that skill, but pitching your writing ideas is going to be important if you're going to undertake a scientific writing career. Having example pieces on your own blog or on your own website is also very important. Um, if you are able to get published on some other blog, that's also really nice to highlight in your resume. And there's lots of different places where you may be able to just within your own scientific niche, find a website or an association that might allow you to write something based on a pitch to build your portfolio and resume. Um, an example for me is uh, the developing biologist world, right? Because I worked on molecular cellular neurodevelopment. There's a resource called the Node, and it publishes interesting written pieces from the developmental biology community. It's very easy to pitch them. I'm not going to get paid, but it does get my work where I can list it on my resume that's been published somewhere else. So write example pieces and write pieces that can be displayed on your site and others. And if you're just starting out, you may be able to find a scientific niche that allows you to do it really easily before you're able to pitch to those bigger journalism networks. And finally, and lastly, social media. Highlight what you're doing every now and then. See what other people are doing via social media. It's always a good idea. And are there any questions about scientific writing careers? I think most people here are interested in scientific illustration, which is good. That's my expertise. But any questions on scientific writing before I shift? Would I recommend a degree in SciComm for those who don't have a PhD but are interested in breaking into the writing field? I have experience in medical editing, but not writing. Interesting. I would say if you're interested in breaking to the writing field, I would say if you're already in your education path and you want to take a SciComm degree, that's great. If you've already finished your bachelor's and you're contemplating going back to school for a graduate degree in a SciComm area, I don't necessarily personally recommend investing a lot, all that money in a full degree, even if you don't have a PhD. There are other ways to gain experience in medical writing. And even if you just start to Honestly, get your own certifications, learn more, maybe even intern with uh, as, a, as in a medical or research institution. You can get internships, which again, most likely you are unpaid, but you can get internships where you can collaborate or join a lab and do a part-time certificate where SciComm skills and science skills are building at the same time. I, I have to look up the exact ones I've seen, but if you have no science background, it is helpful to get experience working side by side with scientists to then be able to more effectively write about science in a way that comes from some scientific experience. So that's my recommendation. Best stage to move to these careers. And after bachelor, master's, PhD, or postdoc? Ooh, this is a good question. I would say anytime. Anytime is the right time. <laughs> it doesn't matter 
if you are getting a bachelor degree now or you haven't even started your bachelor's degree, you can start to walk toward the career that you think will align best with your skills and interests at any point in your careers. I mean, scientific illustration, yes, it's nice that you have a master's or a PhD in a scientific field. But if you are in your bachelor stage and you already know you want to do a SciComm career, then maybe for your master's degree, look for SciComm masters, right? Look wherever stage you're at. If you're looking for more education, try to find an education point that aligns with your SciComm interests. I don't think there's a specific best stage. You can do it at any time. Okay, take a little sip of water. And we are going to move to, which I think branches well into that, you know, when do I move to these careers? And that doesn't, I mean, there is no, there is no one way to build a SciComm career. It depends on what you're interested in and the skills you want to build towards that interest. So you could be considering really almost any company that's related to science and be building skills and building your resume and showcasing what you have done on LinkedIn and or other sort of resume focused things to build a career. Here's where I want to point out that again, I took, so I started PhD. I started illustrating while doing my PhD. I started my own company after I graduated, but I didn't quite have enough clients yet or all the skills I wanted and needed to fulfill a full salary for myself. That led me to look for, be a little creative and look for companies I could get some experience in. And I started working with the marketing company that does search engine optimization. And it was data analysis. It was graphic design. It was writing. It was a very interesting first job outside of academia that helped me build a lot of new skills that didn't take me off my path from SciComm. It really just built skills that I then left that job once I felt like, okay, I've learned a lot about this other industry that I can apply to my own company, right? Getting on the first page of Google search is a very valuable skill. And that's what this company taught me a lot about. And so don't be afraid to start walking towards your goals at any stage. Listen to yourself, reflect on what's working, what's not, what are your strengths, updating your resume and building a career that makes sense to you, right? It's not always going to be a straight path. Mine wasn't. A lot of people I know do not have a straight path and mine still may be evolving. You know, I like animation. I might start to build my own skills to increase my animation and 3D animation skills. So there's never going to be one set and done way to do any of this. I want to make sure that you guys get the message that you can follow your own skills and build whatever you want, right? There's not one way to do this. Okay. And yeah, again, this is a, I'm going to branch into Something that I feel like if you are in academic research or if you are someone who, you know, is a medical editor but hasn't had scientific experience and wants to get into one of these SciComm fields, don't be afraid to highlight your skills on things like LinkedIn or on your resumes that highlight what skills you have that can then translate into the career you want. So let me explain. What I'm showing you here is from my Oregon Health and Science University. I was a researcher in the neuroscience PhD program. But what I highlighted on my resume were things like project management, data analysis, data presentation design, science communication, grant writing. The things that I went into outside of academia, pitching myself as building skills was project management skills. If you've been able to lead your own editing company or do your own editing work, if you've been able to lead your own lab project, if you've trained 
PhD students or if you routinely presented scientific talks, you may not realize how much non-academic skills you have that translate to any company, right? People are always looking for good project management experience, good organization, good data analysis, good critical thinking. There's ways to pitch the skills you have and think about them in a slightly different way that aren't just, I know how to do PCR, right? I know how to work in mouse experiment models. Right? Those are very niche skills. That's not that you don't necessarily need to highlight if you're planning a transition to a sitcom career. Be creative about the skills you have. Think critically about the skills you have and how to pitch them in ways that speak to your potential audience in a sitcom arena. Um, you have a lot of skills that you may not have thought of in a certain way that can help you feel confident in going into a different career outside of academia or trying something new that's outside of your current expertise. And now we're going to get into some tips for success. I know we only have about three minutes in our allotted time. I'm allowing myself to go over if you want to stay for a longer chat for the Q&A. And my first tip is to be persistent. I think I've said this many times, but success takes time. It took me a long time to build my skills. You know, a tree does not grow in a day, <laughs> nor will your career. So as long as you keep walking toward whatever your goals are, you're going to keep building the skills and finding a niche for yourself. So be persistent. Don't give up. It may take some winding paths or you might end up growing somewhere you weren't expecting, but that's okay. It's, it's going to take time and it's going to be an interesting journey. The second tip I have is know your worth. We've already talked a bit about this, but set rates and make contracts that are worth your time. $35 an hour was what I said I've started at. I've moved up from there. Now I'm 65 to 95, depending on what my services are. And this is something that has to come from where you feel comfortable. But I would say, make sure you set up yourself for success by not bidding too low. And Make sure that you do have a contract in place, or especially with illustration, you have a watermark on your work prior, and then make sure you get paid <laughs> prior to giving them that fine work. There have been a couple times where I've lost out on money because I didn't, I trusted a group and thought, hey, these seem really nice. You know, they'll pay me after the contract is up, or they'll pay me the full amount uh, for the illustration that they need and on a quick turn. And sometimes it's very rare, but sometimes. People will take an illustration and run if you give it to them. So just be aware your contracts are worth your time and or making sure you have a payment agreement up front is worth your time. It's rare, but it does happen. And don't forget to build your digital presence. Um, it is important that, especially now, that you make it easy for potential clients to know you and know your work. So this is something I would say saves me a lot of time. People can look at my website. They know what style I do for illustration. They already have a good feel for the work I do. And when they come to me, they've already seen it. They see it. They know what to expect. They're going to like my style. So it does really help to have that digital presence that lets people know what they're going to get. And I have a question about illustrations. If one of my illustrations is published in a paid article, do I still have a right to share it on my social network and include it on my portfolio? The answer is yes, as long as you cite it. So um, if your illustration is put in a paid article, you have the right to share it on your social media networks as long as you cite the publication that now owns the copyright of that illustration. So that's how you get that. You're allowed to do it, just cite. And if you have any questions, sometimes if it's, I mean, it's very rare, but scientific journals like science, they'll allow you as long as you cite it to use the image you've created. If you're working with somebody, let's say you've created something for a company internally and you do want to share that, maybe you can also just directly ask them if it's okay to share this website design you did for them. Um, but for the most part, as long as you cite them, you can put it on your portfolio. Um, and that's what I do if I, if I want to. I cite it. I have a link to whoever I did it for. Um, as part of my publishing the photo. And 
that's where we're at too. So, I mean, we're at questions already. We just had a question about illustration and animation. We're also at time. And I realize uh, that if you have extra time and if you have extra questions, I'm willing to be here for another half hour um, to answer them. So I, I think I've answered a lot about the illustration, about freelance, less about digital marketing. But now is a great time if you want to stay on to ask any additional questions. And while you are thinking of some of those, I am going to share some of the links that my assistant is reminding me to share in the chat. So that's a link to Affinity Designer. And what I'll probably do is I'll also just review my own recording and just see if any other things I mentioned, I can send a follow-up email to all of you so that you have the list of links and a quick summary of some of the resources I've provided. What is the best way to start with digital illustration? Should one invest in a tablet or a good laptop or straight up start drawing tablets? And it is not an amateur question. That's a great question. Um, the best way to start with digital illustration is to just have a good laptop. And that's my recommendation. I do most of my illustrations by using my mouse, actually. Um, there's lots of different ways. I've used a tablet too. I, I like tablet drawings as well. But I think you learn a lot by learning how to use the digital illustration pen tools. And by pen tool, I'll even pull this up. By pen tool, so I'm hopping into Adobe Illustrator. Pen tool, this tool where you click and drag, click and drag, click and drag to make a shape. And every time I click and I drag, this creates a shape. I'm just using a mouse. And there's a lot you can do by using a mouse and making symmetrical shapes to first learn what is a vector point, this point I'm pulling up and down. You now, how what does it mean when I toggle these edges? Some of the first ways to learn that, I think, is through a laptop and not through a tablet and drawing. But again, to each their own. If you really, if you're very good at hand drawing things. If you are a very good pen and paper artist, tablet might be actually a preference for you. I mean, I'm not the most talented artist in the world. I don't do those incredible cover, lifelike digital illustrations. That's not my strength. My strength is in translating scientific research into really impressive visuals for scientific publications and grants, right? So I have my niche. But if you want to be somebody who creates incredible artwork, for journals and those top tier um, sort of news publications that are more arty, tablets are a good way to go for that. But again, even if you're doing that kind of artful work, learning how to click the points and move the points and how they work can be done on a laptop without it. Is Procreate a good drawing uh, software for scientific illustrations? I have never used Procreate. Um, I would say, if you are planning to have a professional scientific illustration career, as long as Procreate or any illustration software is dealing with what I'm showing you now, which is these vector points for illustrations, then it can be a good comparable software. I know Affinity Designer does vector points. Inkscape is free. It also does vector points. It has some limited features. So I would say starting with Affinity Designer is my top recommendation if you're going to try to become a scientific illustrator to start cheaper and then maybe grow into something like Adobe Illustrator. Ooh, do I have any tips around file naming conventions? I really like that question. Uh, I do, actually. So <laughs> because I work on a lot of different files every single day, um, my preferred is SSP, which stands for Simplified Science Publishing. And then I immediately put a date on it. So 2022, 10, 28. If I were to create the webinar illustration, whatever, dot AI, Adobe Illustrator file, having this at the front, and especially, I mean, I would have likely sort of client name and then description um, helps me quickly sort out by date what I've done for who and which version is it, <laughs> right? Because often you'll do draft one, get your feedback from your client, draft two. If, if you front load 
your file names with the date, it makes it really easy for you to best understand which iteration you're on and which is the most recent. That's my favorite way to actually pretty much name anything is with dates in that way. Um, oh, and having 22 in front means you're never ever going to run into sorting issues. They'll always be in the right order. Uh, okay. Can you please suggest freelance websites for starting a career as a scientific illustrator? Yeah, and I think you've already heard one. Um, so Fiverr, Top Tall, and let me get my chat back open. I'll put them in the chat. So Fiverr, Top Tall, although Top Tall I think is actually quite a professional. You might need to be at a certain experience level. Uh, Fiverr, Top Tall, and honestly, I think just Googling remote or part time opportunities. That's a great way to see what's available and put your hat in the ring because it's free. Again, with things like Fiverr, which is a great graphic design, scientific illustration related portal, um, you still, they, they take a cut of whatever you're offering. So just keep that in mind. Um, it's, it's one of those give and take, right? It actually can help you amplify if you're getting great ratings and you have a good rate, but it's not for everyone. And let's see, what is the work style in your company? How is it organized? Advertising, marketing, illustration, coordination, et cetera. Well, my organization is a fairly small organization. So it's me and an assistant where because I have the skills in digital marketing, right? As I mentioned before, I had actually five years experience with a company doing search engine optimization, which is creating the content, the types of content that get on the first page of Google search. I just rely on that skill to put out high quality resources that bring in people from organic search. And then I just say yes to clients. And I do have someone help manage some of that and how who I'm doing work for and when. But for the most part, I just do it myself, which makes it quite fun. Um, I get to say yes to whichever projects fit into my schedule and make me feel interested. And I have a lot of freedom and flexibility in what I do because I have a just pretty much me as the illustrator and marketer for my company. It's pretty great. And I think I don't see any more questions in the chat and we're 10 minutes over time. But like I said, I don't mind staying a few minutes beyond that. I have a broad question. How would you go about starting your own company and how much money would you need to put down? So if you're in the United States of America, I'm not clear on um, how it works in other countries, but in the US, it's actually only costs around, it depends on the state, but around $100 to start your own company. Um, it's a matter of logging on to your state's sort of business portal and creating a self-owned LLC, Limited Liability Corporation. So I'll put that in the chat. Um, you have to fill out paperwork, submit it, and submit a fee of around $100 a year. That's it. And then you can get paid officially and pay taxes as and have, a, have an EIN number, right? An EIN number is your business tax number. But in the US, it is actually really quite impressive how easy it is. And obviously, I would say if you're going to start your own company, the other costs that are outside of just the logistics of, hey, I have a company that's official with the state and with the country is you're always going to have admin fees, right? So I pay for Adobe Creative Suite. That's part of my company costs. It's about $600 a year, I want to say, $600 to $700 a year. Um, when it comes to my accounting software, I use accounting software now because I have a lot of clients and I invoice a lot. But when I was first starting out, you don't necessarily need to have it an accounting software. You can work with spreadsheets and, and keep track of what you spent, what you're getting paid, and create invoices that don't rely on a software to start. So you don't have to start with that when you're starting your own company. Um, 
yeah, it can be pretty low entry to just start getting work as a freelancer. It's it's not too high of a cost. Yeah, it's a good question though. Yeah, not much money to put down. Any other good questions? Okay, well, this has been a really good chat. Oh, and thank you. I'm getting some thanks in the chat. And I hope you guys enjoyed uh, the webinar. And I will be sending out a survey about what next um, type of information may be most useful. It sounds like a lot of you are interested in scientific illustration. So I'm considering putting out some more live demonstrations of scientific illustration, possibly even picking something that you're illustrating and teaching you how to improve it. So I'll send out a survey um, email again with a lot of follow-up information, just asking what might next be some of the more useful things you'd be interested in seeing. So thanks again for your time and I'll be seeing you in the email and hopefully another webinar soon.